Welcome back from lunch and to the last few sessions of Conference 2021. I would just like to remind you that after the President's final address, a tribute to Rachel Lever will follow. I will now hand over to Dr Lydia Makanoff. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our symposium, Striving for an Exemplar Service for People Affected by Bladder Cancer. My name is Lydia Makanoff. I'm the Chief Executive of Fight Bladder Cancer. Fight Bladder Cancer was established by Andrew Winterbottom, who said it is crucial that everyone affected by bladder cancer, patients, carers, families and friends, has a reliable place to come to for support, information and advice. And he was a bladder cancer patient himself. Who are we? Our vision is a future where everyone survives bladder cancer and lives long and well. Our mission is to lead the fight against bladder cancer to drive and to have this driven by patient and family insights. And our values are patient-led, compassionate, action-orientated, and ambitious. If you would like to learn more about Fight Bladder Cancer, feel free to drop into our Zoom room at 4 p.m. today. Just go to fightbladdercancer.co.uk slash born to enter our Zoom room, and 10 health professionals will be in the chance uh, to win a free Marmalade of London candle. So today we're talking about Exemplar Research and Policy Project, striving for exceptional services for people affected by bladder cancer, defining and advocating for an exemplar service. We are grateful to our industry partners for their support. Editorial control of all materials has been retained by Fight Bladder Cancer. So what's on the agenda today? First, we'll talk about how nurses can shape policy, and then we will dive into the three main pillars of the recommendations for the Exemplar Project putting in place an exemplar pathway, developing and growing the bladder cancer workforce and improving awareness, patient support and involvement in care. So first we'll talk about nurses shaping policy. Julia Taylor, Macmillan Urology Clinical Nurse Specialist and past president of Bourne, will talk about how nurses and patient organisations collaborated to drive the exemplar project. We'll then have Anne McDowell, Corporate Partnerships from Fight Bladder Cancer, talking about the background of the Exemplar Project, how we did our research and how we came to our recommendations. We'll then talk about the three pillars of the re recommendations. First, putting in place an Exemplar Pathway. We'll have Dr Johnston Shaw, retired GP and bladder cancer patient, and Mr Param Mariappan, consultant neurological surgeon, talking about the need for an optimal pathway for bladder cancer across the UK. We'll then talk about developing and growing the bladder cancer workforce. Pauline Bagnall, Euro-Oncology Nurse Specialist and Bourne Trustee, will talk about Bourne's vision to develop educational resources to support nurses to deliver holistic care. And finally, we will talk about how to improve awareness, patient support and involvement in care. And Melanie Coston, Fight Bladder Cancer Support Services Manager and Bladder Cancer Patient, will talk about Fight Bladder Cancer's materials that we have to help nurses empower patients to make informed decisions. If you'd like to learn anything more about any of this, please drop into our Zoom room at 4 p.m. today by going to fightplattercancer.co.uk slash born. And now I pass the floor to Julia Taylor, who will talk about nurses shaping policy. Thanks, Lydia. So yes, how, how can nurses shape policy? Uh, it's clearly a huge statement. Um, and when I think about the Exemplar Project, I think about five years ago where we had Jane Broxham and I had uh, curious conversations with Andrew. Um, for those of you that um, didn't have the privilege of meeting him, he was really encouraging, enthusiastic, uh, motivational, real leader. Um, and we found some real common ground, uh, common because of his experiences with his own experiences of having bladder cancer, and ours with um, our professional head on really, um, experiencing working in bladder cancer services for a many number of years. There was a real recognition of the crucial role of nurses uh, for patients with bladder cancer and specifically the pivotal role of the CNS. Um, that passion uh, and the recognition that was real strength in working together to highlight the variances for you know, patients' experiences nationally, of their access to CNSs. We really wanted to be able to highlight the need to understand about CNS workforce, where, where they are, what size their caseloads are, and what education um, they, you actually require, um, uh, what you have access to and what was not available. And subsequently we agreed on, on one thing, 
and that was that further research was required. And so I'm really delighted um, that you're going to be able to hear about the exemplar project today. So the project objectives were, and you won't be surprised to hear this, really collecting and collating the views and experiences of people who were affected by bladder cancer and their families, and also the perspective of the healthcare professionals in the UK. They then summarised the strengths and the gaps in the current bladder cancer service provision, identified steps that are going to be required to really enhance and strengthen and bridge those gaps. And then really talk to the state key stakeholders to identify what we need to do in terms of developing future service guidelines and future research projects. So how do we influence? How do we shape policy? Well, many of you have contributed to this project. Um, Bourne will continue to contribute. Um, you are already shaping policy. So continue to do what you're doing, to speak up, to advocate for your services, to share your experiences, and please contribute to the recommendations to develop a bladder cancer exceptional service for patients with bladder cancer. And now I'm going to hand over to Anne McDowell, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about how the research was undertaken. Um, as Julia just discussed, the first step was scoping the project and trying to decide what we wanted to get out of it. The second step was to try to make sure that we were building on what had already been done. So we looked at the guidelines, we looked at what was already in the literature and understood what information was already collected and documented. The third step was to interview healthcare professionals, and some of you I know were involved in that, and we really appreciate the time and the insights you gave us. And the fourth step was to interview patients and their loved ones to understand their experiences and be able to document those and, and pull them together. To go into a little bit more detail about this research, it was a qualitative research project. And in qualitative research, you're looking to hit something called saturation. So you're looking at how many, when you get answers to questions, you want the same answers to be coming. You don't want to be hearing anything new. When you're still hearing new, you, new things, you want to interview more people. And you keep going until the answers you're getting back to the questions are answers you've heard before. And that means that you've hit saturation. Semi-structured interviews are used. So there was an agreed set of questions that were guided by a steering group. And the steering group, again, had nurses like you on it, had physicians, had patients, had carers, and also had an academic person who specializes in qualitative research to make sure that this was being done in a, a rigorous way uh, that would be uh, understood and uh, respected when it was finished. We ensured demographic representation, so men and women geographically spread across the UK, different diagnoses in terms of severity of their bladder cancer. And after all of the interviews were done, the responses were coded, themes were identified, and that was all pulled together into a report. A little bit more about who was interviewed. As I said, healthcare professionals were one of them. And you can see from this graph, the healthcare professionals are the blue and they were spread across the UK. They included urolo urologists, uh, oncologists, medical oncologists, surgeons, clinical nurse specialists, and again, thank you to those of you who participated. We recruited by talking to people we already knew in our network, but also uh, Bon kindly put a request for participation into the president's monthly email. So again, a fantastic support from the organization. And then people we spoke with recommended other people they knew who they thought might be interested in participating and that is called a, a snowball sample. In terms of the patients, we interviewed 30 people who have had bladder cancer of, as I said, very different severity and 10 of the people who helped to care for them uh, 
And again, if any of you is on, thank you for your time. Uh, that really is what makes this such a rich research project. And at the end, we came up with three key areas of recommendations, each of which has a lot of detail behind it. One is there needs to be an exemplar pathway that is followed for all patients diagnosed with bladder cancer. Secondly, we need to develop and grow the bladder cancer workforce. And I think you are more aware of that than anyone. You're living the difficult experience of trying to treat so many patients with limited staff. And third, we need to improve the awareness of bladder cancer, the awareness of support that is there for patients and improve uh, the involvement that patients have in their own care and their care decisions. So I'm going to pass over to Johnston Shaw, who is a GP and a bladder cancer patient himself. And he, followed by Mr. Mariapam, will talk a bit about that first recommendation, putting in place an exemplar pathway. General practice plays a crucial part of the bladder cancer pathway. It will be where most patients are identified for referral. But clinicians in primary care have limited time with patients who we may well not have a classical presentation. And there has to be a fine balance between referring too many patients and overwhelming secondary care, whilst not missing those with bladder cancer at as early a stage as possible. Did I think that every young woman in front of me in my surgery with cystitis and blood in their urine had bladder cancer? Did I always think that the wee old woman with yet another UTI had bladder cancer? Probably not. And these are the situations that the exemplar report has highlighted. I was maybe easy to diagnose as a 65 year old guy with visible hematuria, but I have to say that receiving that bad news lying there after my outpatient cystoscopy was pretty traumatic. But I'm sure that I'm not alone in feeling that way. Of course, I was by then well and truly in the bladder cancer pathway. And that's where you all come in. You are the professionals who have good communication skills and can pick up the pieces and point us patients in the right direction. My cancer nurse specialist really helped me before and after my surgery and dealt with all sorts of issues that my GP really wouldn't have been able to deal with. GPs are likely to have had very few bladder cancer patients on their lists, and probably none with a urostomy like me. So GPs do need the right switches on to what to look out for with bladder cancer. Pathways and guidelines need to be there to get the right patients going in the right direction. And you as urology nurses need to be involved in developing them. And I'm very fortunate to have been involved in a Scottish collaboration dealing with pathways, which I'm absolutely certain will help. I think it is really exciting and hopefully I've noticed things which have been missing and I know that my GP colleagues will readily work with them. Good afternoon. Many thanks Lydia, Fight Bladder Cancer and Bound for asking me to speak about the pathways here today and these are of course the referral and treatment pathways in bladder cancer. This is a huge topic and given the time limits perhaps Let's address the brief by touching on some principles that have worked well for us here. So colleagues, as we all know, bladder cancer is a very time sensitive disease, which therefore makes early diagnosis vital to improving outcomes. Effective and efficient pathways are therefore needed to make this all work very well for the benefits of our patients and at the same time to protect NHS resources. I just have four key points to highlight here. Firstly, the public need to be made aware of red flag symptoms, which will then empower them to seek the necessary help 
in a timely manner. Primary care colleagues then, armed with guidelines, should fast track appropriate patients down an urgent suspected cancer route when indicated. Secondly, once in the hospital and following the diagnosis of bladder cancer, the process should ideally work towards dedicated lists or sessions. We should also have clinician-led triage to prioritize patients, and the process itself is supported by a multidisciplinary team, which includes colleagues from the Medicine of Elderly Department, for instance, all taking a more nuanced approach towards expediting higher risk patients while practicing realistic medicine and ensuring good communication and support for the patients and their carers. This approach then continues into timely MDT and risk stratified patient-centered care and surveillance. Nursing colleagues like yourselves make a huge difference in the process here. And then finally, we'll use quality metrics and appropriate targets with mechanisms for audit and feedback to evaluate not only our outcomes, but also the process itself. This will then leave us with a really comprehensive fit for purpose process as seen here. Gurft Academy, as you've heard yesterday, and the Scottish Government have separately developed such processes and pathways. And you will all be essential to the success of such programs. On that note, I hand over to Pauline Bagnell to talk about nurse education. Many thanks for your time. I want to introduce you to Dorothy Markham. I've never met Dorothy, but her contribution to Fight Bladder Cancer Exemplar Research Report has stood out for me and reminds me why education for nurses is so important. Dorothy has been treated for bladder cancer and today she represents our patients. Dorothy reported that when she had to be readmitted to hospital with wound problems, the nurses knew very little about bladder cancer. She felt she had to direct them. Next slide, please. Nurse education is important to maintain standards of care, to make sure we stay up to date, to ensure we provide the most effective and safe care for our patients. Next slide, please. Bourne is here to provide education for urology nurses, to ensure excellence in urological nursing. Next slide, please. Despite revalidation requirements of 35 hours relevant to our practice uh, study every three years, accessing education can be challenging. Next slide, please. We are short staffed and with unfilled vacancies, isolation and sickness. We find it difficult to get time off for study in our own working time, and most of us are studying in our own time. Unfortunately, Bourne has not been able to provide in-person training events for almost two years, but in any case, people would have been unlikely to attend. Urological nursing covers the whole urinary system. Urology is a vast subject, and Bourne needs to use their resources to cover all of those urological diseases, and therefore we may not necessarily find what we most need available. Referring back to Dorothy, patients with urological problems, including bladder cancer, are not always treated on urology wards. Since urology wards have been centralised, urology surgery is performed in fewer places. Experience and skills are concentrated in less hospitals. People like Dorothy may find themselves in a district general hospital being looked after by nurses whose educational priorities relevant to their practice are not bladder cancer or urological disease and who do not have the networks or contacts to seek advice or support from us. Next slide. COVID-19 has made us move to webinars. As a result, these are available to anyone with an interest in the subject and are therefore available to a wider audience. Cystectomy and neobladder is planned for September 2022. You, are the best resource for nurses who are new to urology or don't work in urology. Please signpost them to Bourne and Fight Bladder Cancer's websites and educational resources. I think we would all agree that patient information booklets were a valuable educational resource when we started in urology. Next slide, please. The NMC code requires us to share our knowledge and skills, but how can we reach nurses who don't have any experience of urology nursing? 
there are things we can do. For example, consider letting patients know that our contact details can be used by healthcare professionals who need any education, advice or support. Our professional education is important for up-to-date, safe patient care, ensuring that we stay up-to-date and participate in regular educational activities relevant to our practice is our own responsibility. We have shown more than ever this last 18 months or so how we are prepared to go the extra mile for our patients. But we also need to look after ourselves and find time for our education to avoid patients like Dorothy to having to do the teaching. I will now hand you over to Melanie Costin, who is going to talk about signposting and support. Hi, I'm Melanie Costin, the Support Services Manager for Fight Bladder Cancer. I'm a bladder cancer patient myself, and so know how important it is to understand what might happen and where to ask for help and information. We have free materials available for you that empower patients to make decisions. We know that urology nurses are notoriously busy, that it continues to be a difficult time, and some of you may be feeling rather overwhelmed. We're here to help you and your patients, so please get in touch. We have different ways of providing support to your patients and their carers. You could point them to our private forum, which is available and monitored 24 seven. They will have the opportunity to talk to others or to sit in the background and pick up tips and suggestions, really invaluable information from those going through something similar or have been there already. If your patient prefers speaking privately to someone on a one-to-one -one basis, then we have a bladder buddy service and we'll try and arrange a suitable person to get in touch and offer support that way. There have been some support groups opening up again, but if you don't have one running, you could point your patients and carers to our virtual support group. We meet up once a month in the evening and have a mix of speakers and chat. We've had a range of speakers on topics such as BCG, nutrition. We've even had a clinical trainer showing us exercises. Your patients would be welcome to join us. We have a suite of free patient information booklets. They cover all the things people might need to know along the whole of their bladder cancer journey, from initial tests and investigations, through to surviving and living well. Nurses can order a folder containing larger A4 size versions of all the booklets. Not only are they a helpful tool when talking through a diagnosis or procedure with a patient, but you can choose which booklets are relevant for them. Or the patient can order their own via links found on our website and on our other materials. The patient's version is smaller, around A5. They can have a hard copy sent to them or a PDF version to read on their devices or print sections out. We're happy to produce a free nurse contact card for you. Something to give a patient which has your details on, name, phone number and so on. We can customise them to show what you'd like. It will also have the details of fight bladder cancer, how they can ring us directly for support, email in. It shows how to find our forum and our website where they'll find lots of information and links to support we offer, as well as links to get our free magazine, written and suitable for both patients and professionals. If you haven't signed up, please do. If you're attending BAM this year, please drop into our Zoom room between four and five today. You can hear more about our free materials and also be in with a chance of winning a Marmalade of London candle. We would love to see you. Fight Bladder Cancer is here to help you in supporting your bladder cancer patients. Thank you very much and welcome to our live discussion. If you have questions for any of our speakers, uh, please just pop them in the question and answer box below. Uh, my first question is for Julia Taylor. Say a nurse watching this wants to get involved in policy, but they never have been involved in policy before. What's a good first step for this nurse to take? Um, I think on my reflections, it's always about having curious conversations. So I, I talked about it um, uh, at the start where we were having curious you know, conversations about what the challenges were, both for patients and professionals uh, when we were talking about bladder cancer. Um, and we have mentioned about the Getting It Right First Time project and seeing uh, today and yesterday about the impact that nurses can really make by getting involved. Uh, and again, that came from a curious um, conversation with Simon, who was leading the GERF project. Um, and I, I remember asking him about what, what were the measures that they used to, to be able to, to measure the effectiveness of, of nurses. And, uh, and he had saw a face that went, hmm. Um, and again, it just allowed us to have conversations and for me to sort of share what the variances are in terms of medical and nursing training and what those challenges were. And that's why we were able to influence the first two recommendations of the Getting It Right First Time report. So I would say 
yeah, speak up. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid comment or a stupid question um, and just and share your experiences. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, Johnston, you spoke a little bit about breaking bad news and the importance of doing that as well as possible. Um, how can nurses learn to break bad news a little bit better? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And for 40 years, I was the guy that was giving out the bad news. So getting it was a bit of an experience, really. And I think the key is, is you don't learn it overnight. Um, Nurses have very good listening skills, and that's the key. You have to have um, good eye contact with patients and don't just jump in with both feet, try and gauge the atmosphere of the patient and what they're already feeling, and maybe try and work out what their fears are and perhaps their understanding of their disease and cancer might be, rather than jump in with um, the bad news without any kind of explanation. And I think is the key. Thank you, Johnston. Uh, Mr. Mary Ampen, you talked about quality metrics, audits and feedbacks. How can nurses get more involved in making sure that the systems that they're working in are as best as possible? Absolutely. That's, that, that's a great question, Lydia. Um, I think three aspects come to mind. Um, so you, you, you saw the pathway there that I described. There are several already existing metrics that we have. And the nursing colleagues, obviously a large part of this measurement um, of how we perform, so performance audit, for example. The second aspect is actually, we'd like our nursing colleagues to help us design appropriate metrics that would suit measurement of pa uh, patient experience, for example, you know, using things like PROMs and PREMs. Uh, and the third aspect is actually taking part in the research that's helping us develop new, new metrics as well. So there's, there's plenty of scope and yes, do get in touch uh, with me if you're interested. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Pauline, uh, could you tell us a bit more about um, the 2022 plans, uh, educational plans for bladder cancer and how nurses can make sure that they know when and where these are happening? Hello. So I apologise, there was a typo in my presentation. The, the webinar is actually September 2022. Um, it's the, going to be available to anybody who wants to join. It's free. Uh, you just need to keep an eye on the Bourne website. Um, if you Google Bourne webinars, um, and then you get taken directly to the webinar website. Um, um, well, you always have a nurse speaker who talks about the nursing care of patients and usually a consultant who talks about the actual detail of the procedure itself. And there's usually a very good interactive uh, question and answer session at the end of our webinars. So look forward to seeing that. And just to point out, you don't have to be a member to, to access the webinars. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Pauline. Um, we have one comment in the chat um, from Victoria Julian that says, can I ask what your current protocol is for NBH with normal USS and Flexi, but re-referred within a short time? Uh, would someone like to take that? Yeah, I'd probably take that, um, Lydia. I think at the moment, so if you look at the Scottish protocol that we've developed, uh, we wouldn't do anything for about six months. Um, and if it persists beyond six months, then perhaps repeating the cystoscopy in the first instance would be the way to go. And I suppose obviously it'll be guided by other symptoms apart from just non-visible hematuria and also assessment for any proteins in the urine because it may be a, a nephrological condition. Thank you. Um, my next question is for Anne. Um, so you talked a little bit about the, the three areas of recommendations, and we, we talked a little bit about that today. Um, when we look next year to 2022, uh, what are the next steps for bladder cancer's work to improve policy? Hi, bladder cancer has been spending a lot of time looking at which of the recommendations that came out of the study will have the most impact for patients and which ones we can uh, does that help? Is that better? Um, you know, which ones we can lead as an organization and which ones we want to support that other organizations such as Bonn will be able to take forward. Some of the work that Pauline's just talked about in terms of education is one of the uh, areas that came up as a very strong need. And we are working closely with Bonn to figure out how we can make sure the, the 
patient's perspective in, in all of that work is is there and also uh, possibly work together in partnership on, on some, some programs. But I think in, in general, looking at each of those, it's um, going through prioritizing and figuring out uh, what the specific next steps are either for white bladder cancer and or our partners involved in bladder cancer uh, across the country. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Melanie, uh, how can nurses work with white bladder cancer to support their patients? Well, the first thing to do is to get in touch with us um, and find out how we can help you because we really do have a lot of information um, to share with you and your patients. And you probably appreciate that when the patient first gets their diagnosis, they're not really going to take a great deal in. But if you can take something away with you, I'm a patient myself, so you don't really look at anything to start with. But when you get home, that's the time when you start to want to find out what's going to happen. So if they can come away with something in their hand, something small, maybe a, a contact card with your details on and our details. Um, and we have our new patient information booklets, which will take them right from that very first moment of tests and diagnosis. So really just, just to make sure, please get in touch with us and, and we can discuss how we can help you because there's so many ways that we can make it hopefully a bit easier for you. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, Julia, you, there might be some nurses watching this who want to get more involved with Bourne's activities but don't quite know how. Are there any opportunities for volunteering within Bourne? There's loads of opportunities. Uh, I mean, as you sort of alluded to before, there's um, lots of activities that go out through the Bourne um, President's email. Um, so anything uh, like with the exemplar study um, and um, when we were looking, um, we worked with BAUS um, on inviting nurses to be involved about what sort of surveillance they use for patients with bladder cancer because there was a whole, clearly a whole cohort of nurses who were involved in that sort of work. Um, they can come and sit on a trustee board meeting if they want to see how it works. Um, again, message, messaging is easy. We've got a great network in terms of Facebook page. So if there's anything really that particularly somebody wants to be involved, and we've, we've seen that works very well because um, we've got great representation on the, on the, the GERFT um, pathways. Um, I think those are just my start of the five. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Johnston, perhaps you can speak a bit more about how your nurse improved your bladder cancer journey. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but from the start, going back to the breaking bad news thing, um, it was somebody that was around when they needed, I needed somebody to pick up the pieces, basically. I don't know if any of you have experienced patients being given a diagnosis in an outpatient theatre. It's quite traumatic. And I think ideally having a, a nurse who specializes in bladder cancer, who knows a bit about it and the pathway and is able to communicate well and is able, well, in the old days before pre-pandemic was able to even put a hand on you to, to encourage you, that helped. Also seeing the same, I know there, there's recruitment problems as with everywhere in the health service, but seeing the same person before the operation in the hospital and afterwards dealing with and um, being easily contactable by mobile or email, uh, asking the questions that we all have about our wound, our stents, our stoma. I know that stoma nurses are involved as well. So there's a lot of things that <coughs> um, nurses and um, urology nurses are the only people that are trained to deal with. And um, community nursing or GPs wouldn't know the answer to a lot of these questions. So I'm not having access to clinical nurse specialists would really, really made my, my job, my, my pathway and much more difficult. Sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional. <laughs> Thank you, Johnston. Uh, yeah, we're very lucky to, to have such amazing nurses. Uh, Mr. Marriott, and we have a question from the audience. Uh, what are the untapped opportunities you see for improving bladder cancer treatment in the UK? Yes, that's, that's actually a fantastic question. Um, Obvious first answer might become funding, <laughs> but it's it's not it's not an easy fix. Uh, however, given given the um, limitations to what we have, 
my 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 own feeling is that you in every institution you need dedicated individuals to see the patient's journey through from the beginning not necessarily in the same individual dealing with the patient but actually overseeing the whole process that sort of clinical leadership and that doesn't necessarily need to be a consultant it can be a experienced nurse uh, nurse practitioners nurse specialists we rely on them a lot who oversees the entire process and you know if you look at Johnston's experience as such someone like that is vital to making sure that it that it all happens and 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 that's a very easy fix it just requires some some will um, and drive and again you know coming back to using things like metrics and that will, you can very easily measure these things and 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 demonstrate success thank you uh, Pauline, you've spoken a little bit about nurses and how we can improve their education. Um, if there's a nurse uh, on this, watching this, and they would like to improve their own education, uh, do you have any other suggestions of how they can keep up to date uh, with everything that is happening in the urological world? I don't know if everybody has access to, M to be able to go to an MDT meeting because I've found over the years that the MDT meetings are a massive source of um, update. Um, and my own MDT that I work with, they um, discuss research in the meetings, they discuss um, options for patients and the reason why, which is always research-based. Uh, and they respond very fast to research that has become available and treatments that um, become available. So MDT is part of my working day, I'm sure it's part of uh, everybody else's working day. It's a question of finding time to be able to attend sometimes. Um, but for me, that's a huge uh, help uh, towards my education uh, and updating. I think um, we get quite hung up on um, um, going actually being at a, a study day. And you have to remember that being at a study day is only a small part of what's acceptable for NMC uh, CPD. Um, actually talking to a colleague on the phone, asking what, what's happening, I've got a patient who's this, got this problem, what can I do? Actually counts towards your CPD. So all those five minutes, 10 minutes all count. And, and use your network, so use your um, contacts. Uh, keep those useful contacts, keep their details. And, uh, and uh, even something reading something like patient information leaflet, it all counts. Thank you so much, uh, Pauline. So, Melanie, um, you've spoken to a lot of patients and you're a patient uh, yourself. Um, as a patient, if you had any advice uh, for the nurses listening, what would you say to them? Oh, gosh. Um, I think really it's uh, things that you already know is, is just that patients don't really take a great deal on when you're talking to them. So to know that there's somewhere that they can go and look for things. And also maybe, I know you're busy, but sometimes the things that patients ask for initially aren't really the things they want. I've found that myself when I've been talking to people. So it's, it's having that, or making the patient feel that you've actually got enough time for them just to hear um, what their worries are, because it might, their, their worries that you might think that they're concerned about might be something completely different. So. It's just making the patient feel that you're, they're not just a number um, coming through, a job done and out they go. Just, just a, a smile or just that bit of extra warmth at the beginning can make so much difference. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously hard to give everybody a you know, real intense specialised um, attention because it's not, it's not realistic, but the patients are really sensitive. And, and if you feel that you have a nurse, I, I have a nurse that I feel... I can talk to, it makes a huge amount of difference. Um, you know, it's about not feeling alone, really. Just the small things, smile, a smile. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, so Julia, we've heard a lot about getting it right first time and the getting it right first time program. Is this gonna have any impacts on the day-to-day -day activities of urological nurses next year? Well, I mean, certainly if, um, if the different organisations and, and your teams have got your information uh, about what, what your standing is, if you like, in terms of your bladder cancer pathways, because they will be different. We know there's lots of difference, uh, differences around the pathways nationally. 
This is around having some great guidance um, and really doing comparing where your variances are and seeing if you can continuously improve your services. Um, I think the, as I said, the first two recommendations around nurses were really making sure that you've all got job plans, uh, a bit like Louisa was alluding to earlier on, making sure that your job plans are actually doable and where they're not, you need to advocate for what it is you need for your services. As part of the exemplar project, as you know, you know we're, we're advocating to have a lead nurse in bladder cancer. So very much like the many years ago when we were looking at prostate cancer and making sure that we had nurses who were, were looking specifically at, at, at that area and um, trying to develop that and raise the profile uh, of bladder cancer is going to be really important. And it's going to take all of the participants, no matter whether they are ward nurses or they work in the day case theatres, whether they're surgical care practitioners, uh, whether they're CNSs, whatever the title, we know there's lots of titles, that's partly one of our challenges is knowing where you all are. It's about you all contributing and, and, and raising your voices and getting involved in that. Julia, uh, and one uh, final question uh, to Pauline. Uh, do you have any final words to the healthcare professionals who are listening today? I think probably my, my final word is that it, it, I, I'm a specialist nurse myself. I know exactly how hard it is to, uh, to find time for education, but we have to do it. It's, uh, it's part of our uh, registration and it's only fair to our patients. And unfortunately, we would all love to have all our study in our work time. My sister's a teacher. She has all her study in our own time, but we didn't choose teaching. We chose nursing. Um, it, it is what it is. We we just have to do what we can um, to be the best nurses that we can be for our patients. Thank you so much, Pauline, and thank you so much to all the speakers uh, today and for working together to improve the bladder cancer pathway for everyone affected by bladder cancer around the UK. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your conference.